This is an ABC News special report. Good afternoon, I'm George Stephanopoulos in New York. We're interrupting your program because there have been two explosions today at the Boston Marathon. Two explosions near the finish line just a short while ago. You see the scene right there, explosions right by the finish line. The winners had passed several hours before. Some stragglers were coming by, but several people on the scene are said to be injured. You see the commotion right there in Boston today. Of course, the Boston Marathon, one of the premier sporting events in the country. The Boston Marathon is held annually on Patriots Day, the third Monday in April. The 117th running in 2013 fell on Monday, April 15th. The course starts in West Suburban Hopkinton. And there they go! It winds through suburban towns and Boston neighborhoods until culminating at the finish line on Boylston Street in Boston's Back Bay neighborhood. 23,342 runners started the race. They were supported by more than half a million spectators. The runners entered the Back Bay neighborhood on Commonwealth Avenue, turned right onto Hereford, then left onto Boylston Street to the finish line near Copley Square. Viewers familiar with the Aaron Hernandez story will recall the shooting of Safiro Furtado and Daniel De Abreu. That shooting occurred the previous July, less than a mile from the marathon finish line. This is a view of Boylston Street at the finish line, looking southwest along the last leg of the marathon route. The elite runners started the race at 10 a.m and crossed the finish line just over two hours later. Thousands more runners continued finishing throughout the day. Spectators are concentrated in the finish line area. At 2.49 p.m., almost five hours after the start, 5,700 runners had yet to finish. <laughs> The first bomb detonated at 2.49.43 near the finish line in front of Marathon Sports at 671 Boylston Street. This is a street view of Boylston Street looking west. The first bomb detonated here, just west of the finish line, in front of the Marathon Sports store. Approximately 12 seconds later, and approximately 600 feet, or 185 meters to the west, the second bomb detonated in front of Forum, a restaurant at 755 Boylston Street. This is a street view of 755 Boylston Street with an overlay of the Forum restaurant. The second bomb detonated in front of Forum. This footage from a surveillance camera at Forum captures the explosion. Forum was heavily damaged and was closed for four months. This photo is from 2013, after Forum reopened. The address of 755 is visible in both images. Forum closed for good two years later in March of 2015. As of 2024, it's a Raising Cane's restaurant.
The following are two recordings of the second explosion, both shot from west of Forum and the detonation. One was made on the sidewalk outside of Walgreens at 841 Boylston Street. Another was shot by a runner passing Fairfield Street in the Capital One Bank at 799 Boylston Street. This is Boylston Street looking east toward the finish line. The camera is on the sidewalk by Walgreens. The bomb detonates 500 feet to the east and the spectators flee. Moving east on Boylston toward the finish line. This footage, shot by a runner, picks up as the runner crosses Fairfield Street and is passing by the Capital One branch. The bomb detonates at Forum, 150 feet away. Around 3 o'clock, a fire broke out about three miles southeast of the Marathon finish line at the JFK Presidential Library and Museum at Columbia Point in Boston. This is a video from the explosion of the JFK, and you can see flame in the corner of the picture, and, and it's, it's fairly intense flame, and you can see the black smoke, the thick black smoke that is coming through. So here's Ed Davis talking about it, folks. If you haven't heard what the Boston Police Commissioner said, here's what he said about this incident here. Listen. There has been a third incident that has occurred. Um, there was a, an explosion that occurred at the uh, JFK Library. So this is very much an ongoing event at this point in time. Uh, we are not certain that these incidents are related, but we are treating them as if they are. Initially, Authorities thought the fire may have been related to the bombings, but it was later determined that it wasn't. The injuries on Boylston Street were horrific. Three people died at the scene, and some 260 were injured. Eight-year-old Dorchester resident Martin Richard and 23-year-old Boston University student Lindsay Liu were killed by the blast at Forum. Crystal Campbell, a 29-year-old resident of Medford, was killed by the bomb at the finish line. Fortunately, there were many medical personnel and first responders on hand ready to deal with potential health issues with the runners. The medical personnel, along with runners and civilian volunteers, managed to get the injured stabilized enough to be taken to area hospitals. More on that later. A command post was set up around the corner from the finish line at the Copley Weston Hotel. Heading the investigation were Boston Police Commissioner Ed Davis and Richard Delorier, special agent in charge of the FBI's Boston Field Office. That included the FBI Explosive Ordnance Disposal Team and all SWAT units. Also brought in to assist were all available units of the Massachusetts State Police. The Boston PD, the Massachusetts State Police, and the FBI were joined by the Massachusetts National Guard. U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder pledged the support of the federal government. In addition to the FBI, the ATF, the U.S. Marshals Service, Customs and Immigration, and Homeland Security would all participate. It would be a federal, state, and local investigation. Once the bombings had been classified as an act of terrorism, the FBI and Richard Delorier took command of the investigation. The Black Falcon cruise ship terminal at 1 Black Falcon Avenue was used as an evidence warehouse. The Black Falcon cruise ship terminal, now known as Flynn Cruise Port Boston, was vacant enough in April to allow for evidence collection and crime scene reconstruction within the building.
technicians in the Computer Analysis Response Team, or CART Lab, at the FBI field office examined numerous surveillance camera video recordings. They also received thousands of videos and photos from the public to examine. FBI technicians found a suspect in this photo shot by a spectator across from Forum. They identified a backpack in the exact location where the second bomb exploded, belonging to a man wearing a white hat. They then examined video surveillance footage from Forum looking for their suspect. They spotted the man with the white hat. He walked up to the bomb location and placed his backpack on the sidewalk amidst a group of spectators in the exact location of the detonation. They then looked for the suspect in surveillance footage from several other Boylston Street locations. The suspect was first seen on surveillance cameras at 2.37 p.m. on Gloucester Street outside Whiskey Steakhouse. This is a photo of Whiskey Steakhouse at the corner of Gloucester and Boylston Streets. It closed in 2020. As of 2024, it's a Santander bank branch. The suspect was seen here on Gloucester Street, accompanied by a man with a backpack wearing a black hat. The suspects, now known informally as White Hat and Black Hat, turned the corner onto Boylston Street and headed east toward the finish line. They stopped and talked in front of Back Bay Social at 867 Boylston Street. They were spotted moving east past the Bank of America branch at 855 Boylston Street. At 2.42 p.m., a Walgreens camera at 841 Boylston Street recorded them passing by together. Moving east on Boylston Street. Shortly after passing Walgreens together, Black had a scene passing by Forum alone. He walked to the finish line area, stopping amid the crowd in front of the Marathon Sports Store. White Hat was photographed alone by Creighton Barrow at 777 Boylston Street. At 2.45, White Hat was seen walking up to Forum. He stops by a small tree and sets his backpack on the sidewalk. He then stands among the people his bomb will soon kill or maim and watches the runners. At 2.48, he makes a brief phone call. At 2.49, the spectators react to the first explosion and White Hat starts to walk away. Just after he leaves the frame, the bomb detonates. After the explosions, Black Hat was spotted on Exeter Street, passing by the Kingsley Montessori School. He was without his backpack. White Hat was seen without his backpack, fleeing west with the crowd on Boylston until turning a corner at Fairfield Street. The identities of White Hat and Black Hat would not become known until later in the week. White Hat would be identified as 19-year-old Jahar Sarnayev and Black Hat as his 26-year-old brother Tamerlan. They were raised in the former Soviet Union country of Kyrgyzstan. Jahar immigrated to the United States in 2002 at the age of 8. 
Tamerlan emigrated two years later at the age of 16. They considered themselves Chechens based on heritage as neither had ever lived in Chechnya. They lived in an apartment in Cambridge, just three miles from the marathon finish line. The Sarnea brothers lived in an apartment in this building on Norfolk Street in Cambridge. Tamerlan's wife Catherine, also known as Karima, and their young daughter Zahara also lived there. A street view of the Sarnea residence in Cambridge. It's the brown building in the background. At the time of the bombings, Tamerlan was an aspiring boxer and Jahar was a sophomore at the University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth. On their way home, only 23 minutes after the bombings, the Sarnayev stopped at the Whole Foods Market on Prospect Street in Cambridge. Jahar is seen on a surveillance camera entering the store. He casually buys a bottle of milk and returns to their car. He learns he bought the wrong type, so he goes back into the store to exchange the milk. That night, the brothers ate dinner at the SNS Market in Somerville. Allegedly, Tamerlan's friend and fellow boxer, 27 year old Ibrahim Todeshev, ate with them. Todeshev and Tamerlan Tsarnaev were considered the prime suspects in a 2011 drug-related murder of three men in Waltham, Massachusetts. Todeshev confessed to the murders in May of 2013 during an interview, at which time he was shot and killed by an FBI agent. That same night, after the afternoon bombings, Jahar tweeted, Ain't no love in the heart of the city. Stay safe, people. The next day, Tuesday the 16th, Jahar made the 60-mile drive back to UMass Dartmouth. There he lived in a sophomore dormitory called Pinedale Hall. He was seen that night on surveillance cameras with friends at the University Fitness Center. By Wednesday the 17th, the FBI had determined that White Hat and Black Hat were the bombers, but were unable to identify them. Ed Davis, Boston Police Commissioner, wanted to release the surveillance photos immediately to elicit the help of the public in identifying the suspects. Richard Delorier of the FBI was against release of the photos. The FBI didn't want the suspects to know that they had been detected. They felt that might cause them to flee or motivate them to take further action. USDA, Carmen Ortiz, representing the U.S. Department of Justice, was also against releasing the photos. That being the ultimate authority, the photos were not released. Police Commissioner Davis was extremely disappointed with the decision. The next day, Thursday, April 18th, photos were leaked to a Boston television station. That station indicated that they were preparing to broadcast the photos. 
federal authorities and the FBI, despite their anger about the leak, determined that they should release the photos ahead of the local news outlet. Richard Delorier displayed the photos of Black Hat and White Hat at a 5 p.m. news conference at the Weston Hotel. They were designated officially as Suspect 1 and Suspect 2. That night, the FBI's concerns were validated in an extremely tragic manner. 27-year-old Sean Collier had been an MIT officer since 2010. He lived with several roommates on Curtis Street in Somerville. Around 10.30 p.m., his police cruiser was seen on surveillance footage parking beside Building 76, the Koch Institute, on the MIT campus near Main and Vassar Streets in Cambridge. This surveillance footage shows the Sarnea brothers approaching Collier's cruiser. They ambushed him from behind. Tamerlan fired five shots at Collier. Jahar attempted to steal his handgun. The gun was secured in a locking holster, and Jahar was unable to release it. They gave up and fled. Police responded to reports of gunfire. Oh my goodness, all units respond. Officer down, officer down, all units. Officer down. This Google Earth Street View and crime scene photos show exactly where Collier was parked on the MIT campus next to the Koch Institute when he was ambushed. This is the handgun for which he was senselessly killed, still in its holster. Collier was rushed to Massachusetts General Hospital where he was pronounced DOA. Approximately 30 minutes after the shooting, around 11 p.m., Cambridge resident Dun Meng, also known as Danny, was passing through Alston on Brighton Avenue when he received a text message. Danny was a 27-year-old Chinese national. He was a Northeastern University graduate student and an entrepreneur working on a tech startup. Danny pulled his black 2013 Mercedes ML350 over to the curb to read the message. The grand jury indictment specified that he was in the vicinity of 60 Brighton Avenue. While engaged with the text message, a green 1999 Honda Civic pulled up behind him. Tamerlan Sarnayev approached and got into the car wielding a handgun. He told Danny that he did the marathon bombings and had just killed a police officer in Cambridge. He took Danny's wallet and told him to drive. Jahar followed in the Honda. They drove to Fairfield Street in suburban Watertown. Tamerlan ordered Danny to move to the passenger seat while he and Jahar transferred items from the Honda to the Mercedes. Tamerlan was now driving. Their next stop was at a Bank of America branch on Main Street in Watertown. There, Jahar used Danny's debit card to withdraw cash from the ATM. As Thursday rolled into Friday, the brothers discussed heading to Manhattan and determined that they would need gas to get there. They stopped at a shell station on Memorial Drive in Cambridge. Notice the mobile station across the street.
The surveillance footage shows them arriving at the Shell station on Memorial Drive in Cambridge. Jahar went into the store to pay for the gas and to get food and drinks for the drive to New York. While Tamerlan was distracted with the GPS system in the Mercedes, Danny saw his chance to escape. He bolted for the mobile station across the street. Tamerlan didn't pursue Danny. He rushed into the store to get Jahar. A frantic Danny pleaded with the mobile clerk to call 911. The mobile clerk called 911 as Danny hid. Jahar left what he was holding and ran back to the Mercedes. The mobile clerk handed the 911 operator off to Danny. As Danny spoke to 911, the Sarnayevs fled. Danny remained in hiding until a police officer arrived. The Sarnayev brothers headed back to their Honda Civic in Watertown. Danny informed law enforcement how to follow his vehicle using GPS tracking. The Mercedes was located by GPS near Dexter Avenue and Fairfield Street in Watertown. At 12.41 a.m., Watertown officer Joe Reynolds spotted the Mercedes at 89 Dexter Avenue on the corner of Dexter and Fairfield. Reynolds followed the Sarnayevs down Dexter Avenue and onto Laurel Street. As Reynolds followed the Mercedes and Honda onto Laurel Street, they unexpectedly stopped in front of 61 Laurel Street and Tamerlan emerged, firing at Reynolds. Reynolds, not expecting gunfire, retreated back west toward Dexter Avenue. As he retreated, fellow Watertown officer Sergeant John McClellan arrived and was immediately met by a bullet through his windshield. This is the house at 62 Laurel Street in Watertown, where the Sarnayevs made their last stand. This was home to Andrew Kitzenberg. Mr. Kitzenberg photographed the shootout through these windows in his third floor bedroom. Laurel Street looking west. This is the view the Sarnea brothers had of the Watertown officers who were parked close to the corner at Dexter Avenue. A street view of 61 Laurel Street where the Sarnaevs were parked. This view shows the house at 61 Laurel Street. The photo shows the Mercedes SUV and the Honda Civic and the Sarnea brothers firing at the police. This photo shows the police cars parked by Dexter Avenue. Watertown officer Sergeant Jeff Puglisi got into a close-range firefight with Tamerlan. Remarkably, Puglisi wasn't hit, but he estimated that he hit Sarnayev seven or eight times. Puglisi then tackled him in the street. Though severely wounded, three officers struggled to subdue Sarnayev. At that point, Jahar turned the Mercedes around and headed directly for the officers struggling with Tamerlan in the street. This Kitzenberg photo shows the SUV heading for the officers in Tamerlan. The officers scattered and narrowly evaded his attack. Jahar ran over Tamerlan and dragged him along the street. Through a torrent of gunfire, Jahar managed to escape and sped off to the west on Laurel and then Spruce Street. West of School Street, Laurel becomes Spruce Street. Tamerlan was taken to Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, where doctors attempted to save him. He succumbed to multiple gunshot wounds and blunt force trauma injuries and was pronounced dead at 1.35 a.m. The Sarnayev brothers at that time were still known as Suspect 1 and Suspect 2, or Black Hat and White Hat. Tamerlan's fingerprints were taken, and multiple records were found that identified him. From there, they learned that his accomplice was his 19-year-old brother, Jahar. 
Officer Richard Donahue of the Massachusetts Bay Transit Authority was shot in the crossfire. He was rushed to Mount Auburn Hospital. Despite being clinically dead due to massive blood loss, he was treated and made a complete recovery. Remarkably, he was the only member of law enforcement seriously wounded in the shootout. Jahar abandoned the heavily damaged SUV about a half mile west on Spruce Street near Lincoln Street and fled on foot. It's evident from this photo in Google Earth Street View exactly where the SUV was abandoned. The front of this house is recognizable in both views. This is another view of the heavily damaged SUV abandoned on Spruce Street. The tree, pole, and sign are visible in both images. Lincoln Street. Jahar headed down Lincoln Street on foot, then over to Franklin, where he found a place to hide out. Because of Jahar's unknown location and that he was considered armed and dangerous, a lockdown for the entire city of Watertown was issued. Soon after, the lockdown was extended to the greater Boston area, including Boston proper. At daybreak, a house-to-house -house search was begun in Watertown. The search continued throughout Friday, with all of the Boston area on lockdown. By 5 p.m., after no sign of Jahar had been found, it was decided that the lockdown should be lifted. With Jahar's location still unknown, the tension level was high, especially in and around Watertown. David Henneberry stepped out of his home at 67 Franklin Street in Watertown and noticed that the tarp covering his speedboat had come partially detached. The boat was trailered on his driveway near his backyard garage. This street view shows the house at 67 Franklin Street in Watertown. The area where the boat was stored is blurred. This overlay shows where the boat was located. Upon inspection of the tarp, he saw blood and a person in the boat. He immediately informed law enforcement. His property was quickly surrounded by law enforcement personnel. Police proceeded cautiously. Eventually, SWAT team members approached the boat and Jahar surrendered. He was badly wounded. He was quickly taken to the ground and handcuffed. He was then taken to Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center for treatment of multiple injuries. News of Jahar's capture set off citywide celebrations. The police were heroes. Jahar Sarnayev faced 30 federal charges when his trial began at the John Joseph Moakley United States Courthouse on the Boston waterfront. Jury selection began on January 5, 2015. Opening arguments were presented on March 4, 2015. On April 8, 2015, Sarnayev was found guilty of all 30 counts against him, including usage of a weapon of mass destruction resulting in death.
spontaneous shrines created by the public inspired permanent memorials which were built at the sites of the crimes. A memorial to Officer Sean Collier was created on the MIT campus. Two memorials for the three victims killed by the bombs during the marathon were created on Boylston Street. The Sean Collier Memorial a sculpture formed by 32 massive precision-fit blocks of granite was designed, engineered, and funded by MIT students and faculty. It was completed in less than two years and was formally dedicated on April 28, 2015. The memorial to Crystal Campbell was installed on Boylston Street near the finish line where she was killed by the first bomb. A single granite pillar was placed in her honor. An identical memorial was placed west on Boylston Street at the location of the second bomb. Two granite pillars, fused together, were placed in honor of victims Lingzi Liu and Martin Richard. Each of the Boylston Street memorials feature four glass spires and two cherry trees. the way the Boston area medical, law enforcement, and citizenry responded to the attacks was exemplary. More than 260 people were injured that day. Remarkably, thanks to the quick thinking and selflessness of strangers and first responders, every person with injuries who was taken to a hospital survived. These photos show examples of the many complete strangers who ran toward the danger that afternoon. Though most lacked any formal emergency training, in moments they became a squad of first responders that was later credited with saving many lives. They were heroes in every sense of the word. These men are civilian responders providing assistance to this young woman. She suffered a lethal injury, and without the intervention of these heroes, she would have surely bled to death within minutes. The quick and efficient actions of emergency services and medical personnel after the bombings saved lives. There were medical personnel stationed at the finish line prepared to deal with the typical race-related difficulties suffered by the runners. In addition to immediately tending to the injured, they established a triage area to evaluate the severity of the injuries. Medical first responders arrived within minutes to collect the wounded and get them to medical facilities for emergency treatment. The site was cleared of victims with serious injuries within an astonishing 22 minutes after the attack. They were rushed to nearby hospitals very efficiently since streets were closed and ambulances could easily get through. Boston has an unusually concentrated group of level one trauma centers and major medical facilities in close proximity to the marathon finish line area. All of these facilities were prepared for the volume of severely injured victims they received that afternoon. 
Heroic police officers came under a surprise attack on what they believed to be a stolen vehicle stop. They could have retreated and waited for backup to arrive. Instead, they chose to hold their ground and engage the shooters. In the wake of the bombing, the Boston community stood together and vowed that they would not be defeated, they would not be afraid, and would not be intimidated by terrorism. This maxim became known commonly as Boston Strong. One of their tenets was to safely and successfully continue the marathon, which has been accomplished to date. Marathon number 127, in April 2023, marked the 10th anniversary of the Marathon bombing. Commemoration ceremonies included stops at both Boylston Street memorial sites. 